Erin from The Impatient Gardener here, and I want to talk to you about something that I bet you are thinking about doing in your garden this year, which is growing flowers specifically for cutting, because I think more and more and more gardeners are doing this, and I am all for it. There was a time, actually not too long ago, when I was extremely reluctant to ever pick flowers for my own garden. You know, when you're looking at your own garden, you know how, you are studying that garden. You know it like the back of your hand. So you notice when a flower is missing from a certain area. So I didn't want to pick those because I had grown those flowers to look the way they look in the garden. And then one day I just got over it. And in addition to the fact that I sort of stopped noticing so much exactly where they had come from, Certainly no one else who was coming to my garden ever noticed that flowers had recently been picked. I learned to appreciate my garden in an entirely different way. Now I am not um, a great at making bouquets. I think bouquets are one of those things that um, you get better as you practice. So I feel like I'm constantly practicing. Um, but just a few fresh flowers in the house is huge to me. I love appreciating my garden up close. I also think it allows you to combine plans differently than you would in your own garden. And in fact, it has actually informed some of the plant choices and plant uh, placement that I've done because I have brought them together in a vase first. So I do think it's a really good idea to allow yourself to cut flowers from your own garden. But I understand in your main garden, you know, you might not want to disturb the look you have. So. I think cut flower gardens are becoming extremely popular, or I should say growing flowers for the purpose of cutting. I call this sort of guilt-free flower picking because that is their purpose on earth is to cut them. So you can, you never have to feel bad, not that you should to begin with. So today I'm going to share with you some of my favorite flowers to grow for cutting. Um, but I'm doing this from the perspective of a home gardener, not a person who is trying to make bouquets to sell at a market or as part of a flower farm. There are some really good flower farm channels on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, check out Flower Hill Farm New York, that's Nicole, or North Lawn Flower Farm. They both are very good at sharing really good tips if you are growing to sell your flowers. For me, I'm just growing my flowers so that I have some nice flowers to bring in for bouquets or share with a friend. And I tell you what, in summer, I don't go anywhere without a bouquet of flowers from my garden to take to who's ever hosting a party or whatever. So all the flowers on this list are either very easy to grow or add enough to a bouquet that it's worth a little bit of hassle to actually grow them. So let's get right into it. Top of the list should be no surprise to you, zinnias. Zinnias come in so many different sizes and shapes and colors and they are outstanding probably the main standout in sort of the late summer garden because they just provide so much color. So you can get crazy. Keep in mind that some varieties of zinnias are really quite tall, like can be like three feet or even more. Um, so just keep that in mind. I mean, a lot of flower farmers like that because they love a really long stem. I rarely make a long stem, okay? So I'm more concerned about the color of the flower or the form. Um, one of the ones that I grew in last year that I really liked was a lily putt mix, which was from Floret Flowers, which was very small zinnias um, on longer stems, but really good for bouquets to kind of tuck in. Thought that was interesting, but there are others that I like Oklahoma salmon. Uh, there's oh, all the Queenie Lime series is fabulous. You really can't go wrong. Just experiment with zinnias. You can't go wrong. Next up, dahlias. Whether you grow a dahlia from a tuber or a seed or a cutting, uh, whatever it is, just grow some and then cut them and have some that you are okay with cutting. Look for the really prolific varieties, um, per, in particular like the single forms uh, tend to produce a lot of flowers. And then if you need a longer stem on them, the key is when you cut them, you have to cut down deeper on those stems and then the next flowers that come will have longer stems. Next up is amaranth. Amaranth comes in a lot of different forms. I particularly for cut flowers love the long drooping forms like dreadlocks or um, emerald tassels. So many interesting forms and of amaranth and they're so beautiful in bouquets. Um, just really romantic and lovely. Now they're a little fussy. It's something almost all of us are going to probably have to start ahead of time because they have a long season before they're ready. They like heat, and so in order to get a head start on that season, best to start them inside for most of us and then transplant them out in the garden. They can get quite tall, so you might have to stake them in some way, but 
even one plant produces enough flowers to really carry you through a handful of bouquets. So you don't necessarily need tons of them, but they're just so fun. So a little bit of a hassle factor on those, but absolutely worth having. One flower that I absolutely can't imagine not having, especially for bouquets. Now I grow this one right in my garden amongst everything else because I also think it's beautiful as a flower in the garden is ageratum. There's a lot of different varieties of ageratum. They range from six inches tall to three feet tall. I usually go for something in the middle for both growing in the garden and sticking in a bouquet, but that blue color in a bouquet, especially when you grow a lot of pinks and peaches and things like that is so good. Um, ageratum is another one that likes it warm. So usually better to start inside. They can be a little tricky to start in my experience, uh, but once you get them going, then they really go. Um, and I just can't imagine having cut flowers without having ageratum to work with. Lots of different varieties out there, some that aren't even blue, but I always aim for the blue ones. Um, and the darker blue I can get, the better as long as I still get, you know, like an 18 inch or more stem length on. So all of those are flowers that are really gonna be peaking from the middle of summer onward. So we have to come up with some things to fill in that gap in the first half of summer and spring so that we can kind of have bouquets and things to pick all year long. And the first plant I think of in that situation is nigella, also known as love in a mist. And I first grew it for the first time successfully last year. And the problem I was having with it is that I kept trying to start it inside. Some flowers are just better sowed directly. That nigella is one of those, zinnias are one of those. Um, sometimes we create more problems for ourselves. Now, I will just say this, any flower, any seed can be started ahead of time in pots if you want it to be. Anything can be direct sowed. What you're mostly trying to do is control your germination temperature, control your temperatures, prevent plants from getting eaten by slugs or bugs or rodents or whatever your issues are. So it's more of about control when we start things inside than it is about control of when they're gonna flower, if they're gonna flower in time for us and the culture that they're growing in. So nigella is pretty easy. I just sowed it directly on the surface of the soil in my raised beds. They say the temperature, the soil temperature should be around 60 degrees. I did it very early on. So my guess is it was not even 60 degrees when I did it. Uh, and then it went. And they say that once you have nigella, you have it forever. And I will tell you, it reseeded prolifically. It was all through the gravel paths in my vegetable garden. So I'm hoping it does come back. I can root out the ones that, that don't. But that's all you have to do. And you get these really pretty blue flowers. It depends on the variety you get. They're, they're different. Um, but more than that, they have fabulous seed heads. And I think they look good in bouquets even after those flowers are gone for the seed heads. So those go well into, you know, past the middle of summer because in the beginning you'll have the flowers, whatever you don't pick, you're gonna end up with seed heads, beautiful in bouquets and easy. Basically, you know, th toss them over your shoulder. Larkspur is very similar to nigella and I planted it the exact same way as I planted nigella last year, which was just direct sowing it. Now it is recommended that you actually pre-chill the seeds for seven days before you sow them it won't germinate at temperatures over 55 degrees. So it's a very cool germination temperature. So this might be maybe the very first thing that you think about sowing, but I love it because it is just so easy. You know, I always start more seeds inside than I want to, than I feel like doing. I, I can't really control myself. I am trying to push my efforts towards things that I can direct sow, because if you direct sow, it's a completely different animal in terms of long-term care than all the seeds that you might start inside. So I think plants and flowers that you can direct sow get extra points, even if they don't bloom as long. By the way, uh, my larkspur last year reseeded everywhere too. I fully expect to have a fair amount of larkspur around this year as well. When it comes to talking about flowers that you get your money's worth from, I have to say snapdragons. I never thought of snapdragons as an all season flower. The past two years I have grown snapdragons specifically for cutting. I've, in both cases, I've grown the Madame Butterfly series, which are kind of uh, more open flowers. And in both cases, they have been the very first thing to bloom for me. And one of the last things I picked at the end of the year, they just kept 
flowering. I just kept picking them, they kept flowering. So in terms of bang for your buck, I think you can't beat snapdragons. Now I do start snapdragons ahead inside, usually about 10 weeks before my last frost. It takes them a while to sort of get there. But once you can transplant them out into the garden, they really go. And I just can't believe how many flowers I get. Now, because I don't stake any of my cut flowers or do any netting or anything to keep them straight, they tend to get kind of curvy and hang over. And I actually like that even more. I think they're more interesting in a bouquet when they aren't perfectly straight and they have a little bit of a curve to them. And there are so many amazing varieties of snapdragons. Now, again, when you're buying seed, make sure you pay attention to the height because there are definitely snapdragons that are meant for bedding and growing in your garden. And then there are some that have longer stems that are really meant for cutting. Uh, but I can't say enough about how many flowers and how productive snapdragons have been for me. This next one is probably the most complicated one to get started for most of us. But I can't think of a flower that is more worth growing. It is sweet peas. I've done entire videos on this. I have refined my system. I'm very happy with how it's been working for me the past few years. And I can't imagine my garden without sweet peas in it. They are absolutely delectable. Now, the way I grow sweet peas, I don't worry too much about long stems. I'm, and the stems will get shorter as you cut in a lot of cases. All I want is that little posy of gorgeous smelling flowers. And it is just, so perfect. Now sweet peas can be a little fussy. A lot of heat and humidity is not really going to be favorable to growing them. Um, but I think normally you can eke some out. Now for me, I really like midsummer is when I'm really getting into high sweet pea uh, time of year. So I have a long season with them. It wouldn't matter to me if I had a short season with them. They are so special of a flower that I just don't want to be without them ever. And because sweet peas are a little finicky about transplanting, it's very difficult to find them started growing in nurseries. So when you talk about starting something from seed, you're probably gonna have to grow those from seed. A link to the video that I have on growing sweet peas, highly recommend root trainers if you can find them in order to get a nice long root run for them. They seem to really appreciate that. So this next flower is one you'll probably be surprised to hear, I don't grow very often. But when we're talking about cut flowers, it is a classic cut flower, and that is sunflowers. Super easy to grow, direct sow these. Do not mess around with sunflowers about starting them ahead of time. There is nothing to be gained with a sunflower. Nice big seeds, your kids can help you plant them. The biggest issue you're gonna have with growing sunflowers is keeping all the animals away from them. They are really a favorite of squirrels and rabbits and all sorts of other rodents. So it can be a bit of a challenge, but especially if you're growing them for cut flowers, you have a lot of range in how you can grow them. If you space them out quite a bit, you're more likely to get really big heads. If you're more concerned, if you want something that's a little bit better sized to a bouquet, you plant them a little closer. And of course, there's so many varieties of sunflowers out there. So, you know, you can really pick what you like. And there are some that are multi-stem, some that are single stem. You know, there is no shortage of really cool sunflowers out there. So just take your time and pick what you like. Uh, the one thing with sunflowers is don't bother if you don't have full sun. It's, I don't think it's even worth it if you don't have full sun for a sunflower. Now, the last flower is one that I thought I hated. In my mind, straw flowers were dusty things that ended up in potpourri. And then I discovered there are great varieties of straw flowers out there and they are easy to grow. I also think they actually look great in bouquets. Again, they're a nice size. So many times we use really big flowers. And in order to have a bouquet, I like to have a range of sizes, obviously colors, but a range of sizes um, to add texture and interest to a bouquet. And straw flowers will bring that. Now, I like to pick them when the petals are actually on the outer edge are open, but the inside is still a little bit bundled together in a ball because I think they're really neat looking. And I've been growing one that's kind of a mix of apricots and yellows and pinks. So pretty. Now, most of the guides say that you should think about starting this inside about six weeks before your last frost, but you can direct sow these, which is how I have grown them. Now, they get, you know, I don't get a ton of production out of them, but I think they're worth having because they add an interest to a bouquet that other things can't. And if I can direct sow them, they're easy, right? Now, of course, if you're into dried flowers, they're pretty much a must grow. If you're into dried flowers, I'm personally not, so I always use them for fresh cuts. 
but you can absolutely extend their life much longer and find lots of other uses if you should happen to come across a whole bunch of them in your garden. I actually forgot one more flower, which is Cosmos. I like Cosmos not just because they're pretty and they come in a wide variety of colors, because they are extremely easy to grow. Do very well from direct seeding. So if you just prepare your soil and put down some seeds, you will grow some great Cosmos. Things to keep in mind with Cosmos is don't bother if you don't have full sun. It's a lesson I learned last year in which I tried to push it into part sun and they were a disaster. So only plant these in full sun and keep in mind that some of them get very tall. And also uh, you can also get some more flowers out of them if you pinch them back. A lot of these you're gonna wanna pinch back. Obviously you're gonna wanna follow the directions for each plant specifically, but pinching will help you in many of these to have more flowers. And that also helps with Cosmos to um, reduce the height just a touch. Now keep in mind, pinching does delay flowering a little bit. It's worth it as long as you plant a little bit. As soon as I started cutting flowers in my own garden, I started appreciating my own garden so much more in an entirely different way. And it is extremely fulfilling. So I hope this summer you'll grow a few flowers specifically for cutting, even if it's just a tiny little patch. Guilt-free cut flowers is what we're looking for here. So when you plant them, make a mental note. It's okay to cut them and you should cut them. All right, you guys have a great day planting your garden. We'll see you soon.